Hey guys, it's Katie Whiskar back from UBC IM POCUS, and today we're talking about lung ultrasound and focusing on the basics of image acquisition. So you may be wondering why it's worth it to learn lung ultrasound. Now I love scanning the heart, but of all the areas of point of care ultrasound in internal medicine in particular, lung ultrasound is arguably the highest yield with the shortest learning curve. It's quick, it's fairly easy to learn, and it can provide a ton of valuable information. And we really have mounting evidence in a number of different disease states, clinical presentations, and contexts for the utility of lung ultrasound. And we'll talk more about the evidence in specific disease states in future screencasts, but suffice it to say that lung ultrasound is an application that is well supported by the evidence. And just to drive that point home again quickly, it really does seem to be better for multiple different pathologies than a lot of our standard investigations, such as the chest x-ray, as you can see from this meta-analysis comparing the two modalities. So again, this is a really quick, easy to learn, high yield exam that can be indispensable for you in clinical practice. And I certainly can't imagine practicing without it these days. Today's goal, therefore, is gonna be to teach you how to perform lung ultrasound. And we're gonna focus on acquisition of images today rather than interpretation. And we'll signpost a few great resources for more information on interpretation at the end of the video. Now, that being said, just to give us some context and familiar language for today's screencast, I will briefly mention that there are four basic patterns that you're gonna look for on lung ultrasound, in addition to the evaluation of the pleura itself. And really that's it, there's only four potential signatures, which is part of what makes the learning curve for this application relatively short. You're always gonna see one of these four signatures. So A lines, B lines, consolidations, pleural effusions, plus, as we said, the evaluation of the pleura itself. And here are four patterns, again, A lines, B lines, consolidations, and pleural effusions. And we'll talk just briefly about each one, again, to give us some context for the language I'll use throughout this screencast. So A lines are horizontal reverberation artifacts emanating from the pleural line that represent aerated lung. So that can be normal lung, but we can also see A lines in things like COPD, asthma, or pulmonary embolism, where there is no interstitial or alveolar pathology. B lines, in contrast, are vertical artifacts emanating from the pleura, and they're seen in interstitial syndromes, so commonly pulmonary edema, where there is cardiogenic transudate, aka water, filling the interstitium, but also other things that can fill the interstitial space, such as pus in earlier atypical pneumonia, fibrosis in something like interstitial lung disease, blood in diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, etc. So B lines should travel all the way down the screen, move with respiration, and obliterate A lines. Next are consolidations. So this is what's called hepatization or the tissue-like sign because the lung, seen here on screen left, really does start to look like the liver on screen right. And important to note that in contrast to radiology language where the word consolidation implies infection, in lung ultrasound vernacular, consolidations can be either infection, such as pneumonia, or atelectasis. And finally, pleural effusions. So this is typically seen as an anechoic or black space bordered by the diaphragm, pleura, and a consolidated or collapsed lung. And again, we'll review these patterns in much more detail in future screencasts, but this is just to give you a bit of an orientation to the basics. So before we start talking about the technique of lung ultrasound itself, a brief word about the importance of artifacts. So scanning the lung, and in particular scanning the lung parenchyma, really is the interpretation of ultrasound artifacts. In contrast to when we scan, say, the liver or the kidney, where we're actually seeing the organ itself. And this is because ultrasound beams can't penetrate the air soft tissue interface. Rather, the ultrasound waves interact with bright reflectors like the pleural line and create artifacts depending on the nature of the interface. At the pleura, we see both scatter and reflection of the ultrasound beam. So it's important to understand this basic concept, the fact that we're often interpreting artifacts in lung ultrasound, so that we can be aware of the pitfalls of this technique. All right, so let's get started with probes and presets. So at UBC, we prefer to use the curvilinear probe for most of our lung scanning, as this provides a nice balance between depth of penetration and resolution of the pleura and soft tissues. And you can also scan the lung with a phased array probe, and some people prefer this. Generally, the advantage of the phased array probe in the lung setting is that you get less rib shadows, which can be quite a challenge to navigate, particularly in the dependent views. The trade-off is that you get slightly less crisp resolution of the pleura with the phased array probe. A quick word about the linear probe. 
So this typically doesn't provide enough depth of penetration to visualize deeper structures in the lung, particularly in the dependent views. However, it can be used if the only object of interest is the pleura or more superficial structures. So for example, if you're only interested in lung sliding for pneumothorax, you could certainly scan with a linear probe. In terms of our probe orientation, we are generally going to scan with the dot or indicator pointing towards the patient's head, though occasionally some probe rotation may be needed to get around rib shadows. And in this manner, we will be scanning in both the sagittal plane on the anterior chest and the coronal plane on the lateral chest. Finally, in terms of our presets, we're typically going to scan the lung on the abdominal preset. So some newer machines you may know do have a lung preset and you can try this out, but we find that typically these are designed to maximize artifacts such as A and B lines, but they're suboptimal for scanning the lung bases in particular and visualizing the solid organs, consolidations, effusions, etc. So we tend to stick to the abdominal preset. In terms of our technique for actually scanning the lung, the most important thing here is that we want our ultrasound beam to be perpendicular to the pleura. So we want the angle of incination to be perpendicular. And as you can see from the CT chest slice, the contour of the chest wall often doesn't match that of the pleura underneath it. So you're going to have to employ what we call fanning or tilting. And fanning really is a key movement for lung ultrasonography. So fanning or tilting is defined as movement in the short axis of the probe along a fixed point on the body while changing the angle of incination away from 90 degrees. Fanning allows us to ensure that our ultrasound beam is perpendicular to the pleura. So as a very common example of this, when you're scanning the anterolateral chest, you'll find you need to fan your ultrasound beam medially in order to find that perpendicular angle. And as we go through a few examples, we'll talk about how you can identify whether or not you're truly perpendicular and properly aligned with your pleura. Now, in terms of the actual scanning protocol, so if you've read some of the ultrasound literature in this area, you'll notice that there are a number of different protocols that have been described and all of them are very reasonable and all of them have a few key points in common. So they are scanning in some way the anterior chest. So looking at the lung parenchyma for things like A lines and B lines, as well as scanning the dependent regions, looking for pleural diseases, things like pleural effusions and consolidations. Now there has been debate about how many points on the chest to scan. And most protocols outside of strict research tend to involve between three and eight points per hemithorax. Note that as you can see here from these images, it's possible that you might miss small areas of pathology if you're not making a point of scanning, for example, the very posterior regions. So in general, doing four to six zones per hemithorax is recommended in most sources as a comprehensive lung scan. Obviously, this can be adapted based on your population and the pathology that you're looking for. And again, you can sort of intuit that the more points you scan, the higher the sensitivity you will have to detect small areas of pathology. And your threshold for how long you want to spend scanning the lung versus the size of pathology you care about will differ based on your clinical setting. So here at UBC IM POCUS, we favor a protocol that involves scanning between four and six points per hemithorax, depending on the patient's ability to roll over or sit up to allow you to scan the posterior lung. And again, there is no particular superiority of these exact points over others, as long as you're scanning a representative portion of the lung. The biggest reason to follow a single specific protocol within an institution, such as the one we'll go through today, is so that you can easily label, document, and communicate your findings. So for consistency within our program, this is the approach that we've adopted. All right, so let's talk through those six points briefly. Your first point is going to be on the anterior chest in the mid clavicular line around the second or third rib space. Your second point is going to be close to that same mid clavicular line, but farther down the chest, typically in the fourth or fifth interspace, usually around the level of the nipple or just below. Your third point is going to be in the anterior axillary line right up in the axilla. And your fourth point is going to be in the mid to posterior axillary line at the costophrenic angle. So this is what's been described as the PLAPS point, the posterolateral alveolar pleural syndrome point, and is really key for capturing dependent pathology. Now note that the location of this fourth point is obviously totally dependent on the location of the diaphragm. So particularly in our supine bedbound patients who often have considerable atelectasis or elevated hemidiaphragms, it can be really surprisingly high. And so you'll often have to do some maneuvering to access this point getting patients to move their arms out of the way, asking them to turn slightly in their bed if they're able to, or applying some serious elbow grease and really digging your probe into the mattress in order to get posterior and high enough to capture this point. 
And then your fifth and sixth points will be on the back. So now these will be patient dependent. Some patients may not be able to sit up or roll over to allow you to scan the back. But in general here, you wanna go slightly lateral to midline, obviously avoiding the scapula, with one point more superior and another more inferior. And again, with that inferior point, you're gonna to try to capture the thoracoabdominal interface to catch any dependent pathology. And for that sixth point, it can be helpful to try to slide a little bit more laterally to capture the intra-abdominal organ as a reference point. Now, a few important considerations before we go through an example scan. So again, all points may not be achievable in all patients. Always do your best, of course, but in addition to the posterior points being quite challenging, you may find that your L2 point gets obscured by the heart, as we'll see in our example. Next, and this is very important, if you find pathology, explore the area further. So if you see some B lines or a bit of consolidation on the side of your screen, you'll want to slide your probe around and explore that area to get a good sense of the extent of the pathology and fully characterize it. Again, this protocol is certainly not meant to be a rigid prescription of which exact points on the chest to scan, but rather a guideline to ensure that you've surveyed all areas and done a thorough assessment. And finally, going hand in hand with this, if you have a high index of suspicion for a particular pathology in a patient, let's say you have a hint on a chest x-ray that there might be something lurking there, you're gonna really wanna take time to explore the area in question in more detail and take more clips. All right, so with all that said, let's go through an example scan to show you these points in action. So first thing here, as you can see, this scan is labeled. So really important in lung ultrasound, in contrast to say cardiac scanning, where it's evident where you are in the heart, uh, to label your clips because there's often an absence of lateralizing anatomy. So we need to label the clip to know where we are in the chest. We favor a simple numerical based approach. So R1 through R6 for our right-sided points and L1 through L6, as you'll see. Now we've started here in R1. So this is the right superior anterior chest wall in the midclavicular line around the second or third rib space. And you'll see that our depth is somewhere between nine and 13 centimeters for the anterior chest wall. And this typically allows a good trade-off between adequate depth to visualize pathology and good visualization of the pleural morphology. You can see that we're scanning with a curvilinear probe on the abdominal setting. And we've aligned our view so that we can see rib shadows with at least one interspace in between. Now, one of the key ways to make sure that you're perpendicular to the pleura with your angle of incination is to slowly fan or tilt your probe until that pleural line is as bright and smooth as possible. So here you can see a nice bright pleural line with a B line profile. There are a couple of A lines sneaking in there, but this is definitely predominantly a B profile with those vertical hyperechoic artifacts extending down the length of the screen. Now, a couple more technical pointers. So we ideally want the pleura to lie flat and horizontally on the screen as it is here, but this can be challenging in the dependent views. So this can typically be facilitated by rocking the probe. And the other thing we ideally wanna to try to do is center a rib space in the middle of our screen. With a phased array probe, you'll typically capture only one rib space per clip, whereas with the curvilinear as we've used here, we often get two rib spaces in a single image. And again, just to emphasize, you should always see one of four patterns on long ultrasound, a lines, B lines, consolidation, or pleural effusion. And if all you're seeing is gray fuzz, it's usually because you're not perpendicular to the pleura with your ultrasound beam. And likewise, if your pleura line isn't nice and bright, it's likely because your angle of incination isn't perpendicular. So you're gonna wanna adjust your transducer, primarily with that fanning motion, until you see a bright pleural line with either A or B lines beneath it. Moving on here, so our next point is R2. So this is the right inferior anterior chest wall, again around the midclavicular line, farther down the chest, typically around the fifth or sixth interspace at or just below the level of the nipple. So this location, of course, will vary depending on the location of the diaphragm in your patient. Again, here we can see rib shadow with an interspace in between. We see a nice bright pleural line lying fairly flat on our screen. And once again, here we have a lot of vertical hyperechoic B lines extending down from the pleural line and moving with respiration. One important thing to say about the length of our clips. So with long ultrasound, we typically want our clips to be between four and six seconds long. They certainly need to be long enough to capture a full respiratory cycle as movement of these artifacts with respiration is one of the key features we look for on ultrasound. So if your patient is breathing very slowly or inconsistently, you may need to adjust the length of your clips as it's important that we capture changes with respiration. Moving on to R3. So this is the anterior axillary line right up in the axilla itself. Now we see some soft tissue in the foreground. We see rib shadows 
and then we see that bright pleura line. And note that our pleura is inclined here a bit, which can be tricky to avoid in this view. However, we could try to improve this with some rocking of the probe. And here again, in terms of findings, we see bee lines traveling the length of our screen. So next is our R4 view. So this has been termed the PLAPS point, the posterior lateral alveolar pleural syndrome point by Daniel Lichtenstein, the father of lung ultrasound. And this is really the key view for dependent pathology. So here you want to be in the mid to posterior axillary line at the level of the diaphragm. And the key here is really to visualize the interface between the chest and the abdomen. So we'll start by identifying the relevant intra-abdominal organ, so the liver in this case, as we're on the right side, and then moving cephalad towards the head until we see a lung pattern that lets us know we're in the thorax. And we want most of our screen to be taken up by the thorax. That's the area of interest after all. But the diaphragm and the intra-abdominal organs are crucial landmarks, so should be present on the right side of our screen. And to be even more specific, what we really want to try to see in this view is the diaphragm itself. And note that you won't be able to visualize the entire diaphragm nicely outlined unless there is a pleural effusion or consolidation present in this dependent region. And this is because aerated lung doesn't transmit ultrasound beams well. We'll get scatter and reflection of ultrasound beams, and instead we will see artifacts. However, as you can appreciate from this view, one thing that is often problematic here is rib shadows. And we particularly want to try to avoid having rib shadows obscure our view of the diaphragm itself and that interface between the lung and the abdomen as it's doing here. So if you have a troublesome rib shadow, you can try to get it out of the way by sliding or rotating the probe, or you can try to change the patient's position and have them lie in the lateral decubitus position. You could also switch to the phased array probe here. Although the solid organ and pleural definition is not quite as good, its smaller footprint definitely helps eliminate rib shadows. Note that in this view, I've increased the depth enough to adequately visualize the entire intra-abdominal organ, and typically somewhere between 15 to 20 centimeters of depth is adequate depending on the body habitus of your patient. So here, once again, we can see liver and a bit of kidney on screen right. We get a sense of that elusive diaphragm, although we don't see it very well. And then we have a bit of pleural effusion with what looks in this view to be a non-translobar consolidation and B lines coming into view with respiration. So this is a good example of an R4 point that's probably a bit too anterior. And we get a sense that if we could get our probe a bit more posterior, we'd get a better idea of the pathology going on here. So here we've taken a second stab at this R4 view, and we've managed to get that pesky rib shadow out of the way by sliding our probe a bit more posteriorly. In this case, facilitated by the patient turning a bit onto their left side. So here we can now nicely see the liver, the diaphragm, and then in the chest, a moderate pleural effusion with a consolidation that is likely compressive atelectasis. And note that in this second view, our depth is probably a little bit too shallow as we can just barely see the spine there at the bottom of the screen. And we want to try to make sure that we have enough depth to capture the spine in this PLAPS view as a spine sign is a very useful marker to help make sure we're not missing any small pleural effusions. Next, we're moving on to the posterior chest with the patient sitting up. So this is the right superior posterior chest. And again, we're going to want to go a little bit lateral of midline and make sure we avoid the scapula. So you can see that the ribs are usually quite close together in this location, so we see a lot more rib shadows. And one thing that can help to mitigate this is getting the patient to give themselves a bit of a hug as you're scanning them. So here we can see a couple rib spaces. In this one here, we have some vertical artifacts that don't quite appear to go the whole length of the screen. So these may actually be Z lines or comet tail artifacts. And it's important to distinguish these from true B lines as Z lines don't actually represent interstitial pathology. In this rib space over here to the right, we see a single A line coming in and out of view. And finally, R6. So this is the right inferior posterior chest. So here we're lateral to midline, avoiding the scapula and trying to capture that interface between abdomen and lung. And this is probably liver here screen right, but we might see it better if we slid a bit further lateral. We note a rib shadow, a few B lines and a small non-translobar consolidation, also known as a shred sign. So next we'll move over to the left side and perform the same protocol here. So this is L1, so the left superior anterior chest wall. We're in the mid clavicular line in about the second or third interspace with our probe positioned in a sagittal plane and the probe marker pointing up towards the patient's head. We've got our depth set at 11 centimeters, which gives us nice visualization of the pleural line. And the fact that it's nice and bright tells me that I'm properly perpendicular to the pleura. So my angle of incination is appropriate. 
So interestingly, in this rib space on screen right, we can see A lines, but the centered rib space is dominated by B lines with an irregular appearing pleura, which can give us a clue as to the underlying pathology. And again, we won't focus on interpretation today, but stay tuned for a future screencast all about the nuances of lung ultrasound for interstitial syndromes. Here we're in L2, the left inferior anterior chest wall. So you can see that on screen right here, we have some heart getting in the way, which is very common in this view. And in some patients, you may not be able to maneuver a reasonable L2 view due to interference from the heart. So do your best, but you will find in some patients, this point isn't obtainable. Here, we can see an A-line profile, again, with a nice bright pleural line indicating that we're appropriately perpendicular in the centered interspace. Now we're in L3, so this is the left anterior axillary line right up in the axilla. And note that on our little model here, we're obviously still on the right side, but clearly you want to be scanning the patient's left at this point. So here in our centered rib space, we can see a bright pleural line, one little A-line, and then a few B-lines coming in and out of the picture with respiration. And note that if you're unsure if you're seeing true B lines or Z lines, those vertical artifacts that don't reach the bottom of the screen and don't represent interstitial pathology, one nice trick is to cover the top half of your screen and see if you still see movement of the B lines down at the bottom of the screen. So here we have our PLAPS view on the left. So again, that posterolateral lateral alveolar pleural syndrome point. And again, this view is so key for finding dependent pathology, especially in our hospitalized bedbound patients this dependent view is really where pathology is going to hide, so this is usually your money shot. So here we're in the mid to posterior axillary line on the left side, capturing that interface between the abdomen and the lung, trying to visualize the diaphragm. Now this view is typically harder to achieve than its counterpart on the right, because the spleen is a smaller landmark to identify and is located more superiorly and posteriorly compared to the liver. So obtaining this view sometimes requires a bit of elbow grease, again, to get far enough back and really digging your probe into the mattress, or in cooperative mobile patients, asking them to turn over onto their right side slightly. If you're capturing stomach rather than spleen on the right side of your screen in this view, it typically means you're too anterior with your probe. So here we can see spleen on screen right and diaphragm, and in the chest we can see a hypoechoic or black pleural effusion with an associated consolidation. And there is some ring down artifact coming from the consolidation as it moves in and out of view with respiration. Of interest, finally, here at the bottom of the screen, this is actually aorta that we're seeing. Finally, two clips on the posterior chest. So here is the left superior posterior chest. And again, I often find this spot the trickiest as the ribs are quite close together. In this centered interspace, we don't really see A or B lines, indicating that we're probably not truly perpendicular to the pleura and would need to adjust our probe, likely with fanning. In this rib space to screen right, we see a couple of A lines. And last but not least, the left inferior posterior chest. So this is a bit of a better image. We can see our intra-abdominal organ, so the spleen in this case, on screen right as a nice landmark. And we've got a pretty bright, fairly horizontal pleural line with B lines emanating down from it. Okay, so finally, just to recap a few key points. So lung ultrasound is a bit unique in ultrasound as it relies on both the visualization of anatomical structures like the diaphragm and artifacts, especially when we're scanning the lung parenchyma. So an appreciation for these artifacts and an understanding of how to properly generate them is key. We're typically going to scan the lung with a curvilinear probe on the abdominal preset. And you can scan with a phased array or the linear probe if you're only interested in the pleural line, but we generally recommend the curvilinear probe for most of your lung scanning. Your angle of incination is really key with lung ultrasound, so you always want to make sure that your ultrasound beam is perpendicular to the pleura. And you can identify that by ensuring that your pleura line is as bright and crisp as you can make it, and they're always seeing one of our four basic patterns. So if you don't see one of those things, if all you see is gray fuzz, it generally means that you're not perpendicular with your angle of incination. Next, make sure you're scanning representative areas of each lung, including both the lung parenchyma and the pleura. Our protocol here at UBC is to take four to six clips per hemithorax, which includes two posterior clips per hemithorax in patients who are mobile enough to allow this. And remember, if you have a higher index of suspicion, or if you identify a bit of pathology in one area, you may want to modify this protocol and take more clips. Always, always remember to label your clips as there are no lateralizing features with many of our views. So if we don't label them, we won't know where on the chest we are when we review the clips later. And finally, remember again that you should always see one of four basic patterns, 
A lines, B lines, consolidations or pleural effusions, plus the pleura itself, of course, which also gives us information. So now that you're comfortable performing lung ultrasound, there are a lot of great resources to help you acquire and interpret these images correctly. So first, I'd suggest checking out the pitfalls of lung ultrasound screencast on the UBC IM POCUS site. It covers a lot of common mistakes for both acquisition and interpretation, so it's definitely useful as you're starting out. We've curated some great resources for lung ultrasound interpretation on our site. Look under scanning tutorials and then lung for more of these videos. And finally, stay tuned for future UBCIM POCUS screencasts for a deep dive into the nuances of interpretation of lung ultrasound in various contexts. All right, that's everything today. Thanks so much for joining me, and I hope you found this helpful. Be sure to check us out at ubcimpocus.com for more POCUS resources like this, and follow us on Twitter. Thanks, and happy scanning.